hi folks. Um, this is uh, Richard Hall here from the Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, this is the night sky and I've got uh, Kay with me. We, uh, <laughs> there's weird things happening on the screen at the moment. <laughs> However, uh, we also have uh, Keith Austin with us. There he is there, look. <laughs> Popping up. He's the most important one. You can yeah. see him. <laughs> what, what we're going to be uh, looking at today is actually uh, global warming, but on all aspects, we're going to be looking at the sun and changes in climate and how it's uh, occurred over thousands of years. Anyway, start off by looking at uh, all these magnificent um, aurora that people have been seeing up and down the, the country. And... Um, of course, they were quite spectacular, uh, but you've actually got to be out there at the moment to see them. What will what will actually happen is that you um, <laughs> aurora, the real big burst of aurora. You actually have to be out there at the time, so it's only got to change slightly, and you miss it altogether. Okay. What we do know is that uh, aurora, of course, has all to do with solar activity. And for those of you watching on uh, TV, you can see uh, this photograph taken from the International Space Station and showing an aurora striking on the United States. You can see that it spreads right up into the highest reaches of the atmosphere. So this shows that you can actually see the aurora from, from space. From oh yes, board. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing sight. Yeah, yes. Well, you can see it in its entirety, where of course you, you only see bits of it down here on Earth. Yeah, it's a circle, isn't it, Richard? Yes, yes. We'll we'll go into that in a moment. We'll actually show you. Well, this is all about solar activity. It's about all that that stuff is actually coming from the sun. And um, for those of you on watching this on TV, you can see an image of the sun, and next to the sun is the Earth. All right. And uh, that's the scale of the Earth to our sun now. Sun is a star. You could fit over a million Earths inside the sun. And of course, this, this star of ours has only got a hiccup a little bit, and it's going to have profound effects on the little planets orbiting around it. And that's exactly what it's doing right now. It's having a few hiccups. OK, now, we always tend to think, to think of the... Um, space as being empty but that's actually not true all right uh, sweeping out from the sun from that tremendously hot surface is what we call a solar wind there's a whole mass of particles being blasted into space by our sun all right and it sweeps past the earth uh, for i'll read it what it says for other people it's five to 100 particles per cubic centimeter and these move at 450 kilometers per second as they impact on the earth now this is deadly radiation folks and of course um, that's why we have to have lots of protective gear when we're out in space all right oh. but here on earth we're protected from that and what protects us well it's that magnetic field and we're so used to having that little magnetic field. Do you realise that uh, it's saving your life, actually? Um, and what happens is the magnetic field, because these particles coming from the sun are actually electrically charged, they get by, diverted by the magnetic field. So, the um, so you're saying the Earth has a the Earth itself has a strong enough magnetic field to deflect the um, charged particles, electrons and the protons and that most of the time from the sun. But when you get a big blast, when you get a big blast, what will happen is it compresses the magnetic field and some of the particles sweep round the back and come down towards the polar regions. And when that occurs, that's when we see an aurora. And for those of you looking, you can see a photograph here of um, uh, taken from space showing you the aurora areas as it's uh, sweeping around in that circle, as it comes in and crashes into the upper atmosphere. And that gives rise to those huge aurora that we can see. So when you see an aurora, the Earth is under attack, right? What's happening is partic atomic particles are reaching the atmosphere and reaching inwards to the Earth. Mm. So now what's, what's all the uh, effects of this? Well, let's talk about the solar cycle. For a long while, it's been noticed that the sun shows spots on the, on the, what we call spots, and they always appear dark when when we look at them in uh, 
on photographs because we have to dim down the sun so we can see them. But they're actually so bright, they're bright, a lot bright, as bright as an arc welding torch. They're brilliant. It's just they're not quite as bright as the rest of the sun. Right? And look dark by comparison. By, by, yeah, by dimming everything down. But what people have noticed for a long, long period of time is the number of sunspots we can see on the sun rises and falls over an, about an approximate 11-year cycle. It goes from a period when there's very few sunspots to when there's vast numbers. And, well, what we know is that when we see lots of sunspots on the sun, we get lots of activity. Right. And that reason is, is what you can't see is where those sunspots are, there's intense ultraviolet activity taking place. And some of the you watching this on TV can actually see photographs taken. One, two, one taken near solar minimum to the left, and the other one to the right is showing you as it, as it moves up towards maximum. And you can see there's... A lot of activity there in the solar maximum. Oh, yes. Yeah. A huge amount of blasting going on. Yeah, that's Are right. those really intense patches there that you can see really white-looking patches? Are they where the actual holes are when you showed us the picture of yeah, those? Yeah, that's right. The, the solar in, spots. In the vicinity of the holes, because what those, <laughs> black, those sunspots are... All right, is the places where the intense mag the magnetic field of the sun exits or c moves in. All right? You can see arcs coming out of those and going okay, into indeed. other ones as well. They seem to be in a loop. Now, as this is an 11-year cycle, and for those, again, for those of you watching this on a TV, you can see the 11-year cycle. But notice there's another cycle there as well, about a 100-year cycle as well, as the amount of sunspots rises and falls. Well, I want to show you some interesting things. I've just placed up burgundy wines. Excellent years and bad years. And you will notice that all the best burgundy wines are formed at the time of maximum solar activity. So as an astronomer, I can predict what's going to be a good wine and what's not by the solar activity that's taking place. In so turn... A connection. It looks like it, doesn't it? And if you also have a look, all the bad years when you get poor wines, they are call occur at solar minima. All right. <laughs> now, there's a good reason for this. Plants love UV. Hmm. And, and it's because what's actually happening during solar maximum is more UV reaching the surface of the Earth. Of course, that's what causes trouble with us, isn't it? Yes, that's just what skin I was... cancer, all that sort of stuff. That that's right. you get, you get maximums with those. Yeah, and exactly the same way as you find that good, good or poor wines rise and fall with. But you will also find, if you plotted it out, that skin cancer on human beings rises and falls with the solar cycle. So as we go into our high region of solar activity, when we start seeing a war and things like that, hey, make sure you've got that sunscreen on. Yeah. Now, as a musician. Um, I can also add that um, the best timber for making things like violins and piano soundboards uh, comes from trees that um, were cut down during the solar minimum. Is that right? Because they have minimal growth. Right, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. They're a bit more so, dense. And so the wood is denser, the timber. Yeah. Is. And exactly, Keith, because you can actually see the solar cycle when you look at the core of a, of a, of a tree. The tree rings. The tree rings, yeah. They go up how big they are. So you've got big, big rings when it's a solar maximum, little rings when it's near solar minimum. So this means that you can look at a fossil tree, a fossil of a tree going back thousands of years, and if you can see the tree rings, you can work out what the climate was, all right? And what was actually happening. Okay, now there is a spot, for those of you watching this on t TV, between about 1640 and 1720, where there appears to be no sunspots at all. Now, this isn't because we didn't have any data. Indeed, they, we were collecting data, and this is known as the Maunder Minima. And there was absolutely no sunspots, virtually no sunspots, for about a hundred years. And what I can tell you is, this is known as the Little Ice Age. Mm. And everything froze down, like the, in Britain, the Thames froze over and all that sort of thing. You know? yes, they're ice skating on the Thames River. That's right, yeah. That's right. You can so, see them having parties there, actually, if you've got a TV. <laughs> photo here. Lots and lots of tents on the, on the Thames. So, so what, what this is telling us is when there's no sunspots, the temperature on Earth drops, all right? 
The other interesting thing, although they don't have it, we know that in the 13th century there was intense uh, activity of the sun. The vast, vast numbers of, of um, aurora were observed. Well, what I can tell you is that's a really, really hot time, okay? Uh, solar activity, number of so sunspots increased, and boy, was it hot at those times. It's recorded, you know? In mm -hmm. Britain, for example, for, for about a long while, for about a century, they were growing grapes and things like that which you normally you can't do that until you move south, south into, into Europe. You need a Mediterranean climate to, yeah. to, to grow grapes these days. That's right, and you were getting a Mediterranean climate in Britain during the 13th century. So this is, this is clear evidence that solar activity is slowly changing the, uh, the climate on Earth. But furthermore, we can predict what's going to be happening by looking at sunspots and solar activity is it possible that there are cycles we don't even know about though because we haven't been recording long enough oh yeah quite possibly and that sometimes you could get a cycle that you didn't know about corresponding with a high on our 11 year cycle and therefore it's like a big wave you get a double yeah double effect yeah mm. okay well now I want to have a quick look at the Earth, how this all works, how, how climate and climate changes. All right. Again, looking at this on TV, you show you, it shows you what we call Hadley cells. The atmosphere of the Earth is convecting in these big cells. Where the cell rises, the gases rise, you get lots of water coming down. Because as it rises up, it releases the water, you get a lot of rainforest. Where, then of course the all the water's lost, so where the, the cell descends again, we get no rain, right? And if you look at the Earth, what you will discover is that where the Hadley cells are, 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 are rising, that's where we get all the tropical rainforest. 30 degrees either side of that, we get all the deserts because that's where the Hadley cells are, are descending, okay? And you can, you can see that if you look at it better, you look at the Sahara deserts and all the great de deserts. All these great deserts, you can see them all actually occurring there, right? North and south, and where the tropical rainforests are. Now, global warming, what it does is not just a matter of heating up. What happens is that those cells expand or contract. So what happens if you get a little bit of global warming, just a few, few degrees, what happens is those Hadley cells begin to expand. And that means the dry or the wet regions move. So right now, for example, the Sahara is a desert. But if that Hadley cell moves much, it moves, what will happen is it will be Europe, Spain, Italy, and that which will become deserts. Is it the Had Hadley cell getting bigger in terms of how much latitude it's covering? Well, it's both, but is, is it the expand... The, it gets actually, higher and wider. And it expands out, that's yeah. right. And, and indeed, we know this has happened in the past because we know when we're looking at uh, different things like the... Um, uh, looking at historical events, we know that this, this change in the Hadley cells has been responsible for the rise and falls of civilizations itself. Yes. So it changes rainfall, the migrations of deserts, and the changing sea levels. I'm thinking of the, uh, the Anasazi in uh, Arizona, in the civilization that was um, existed for centuries and centuries and centuries, and all of a sudden, gone yeah because of the change because of the shifting Hadley cell uh, um, over the uh, southern yeah. United States and um, made it impossible for absolutely and look Keith, this is what what we're talking about when we're talking about global warming we're not talking about oh it's getting hotter what's happening is the effect of increasing the temperature of the atmosphere just by a few degrees expands those cells which in turn moves the 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 local climate with its rain how much rain you get how much drought you get it moves that yes. right? and that of course can have a catastrophic effect so it would alter where the rains are coming in new zealand as well absolutely yeah mm, because would. you've got the doldrums what used to be called the doldrums at the equator where all the air is going up so the, the sailing boats didn't get any wind 
to yeah. sail and got stuck. And then you've got where it comes down again and you get rain. And if you increase that, it means the rain's going to fall further south, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, so, so we can see this. So we're observing our sun. The moment I see aurora, I know there's intense activity. Anyway, we should have a little break now. And Keith would like to play a little bit of music for us. And then we'll come back to this story. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> Be there. Right. Okay. Now, we're, we're running short of time, so we may have to finish some of this at our next program because I think it's a very important thing for people to understand. Now, when, when we look at the sun, and I should always point out to you, you never, ever look at the sun through any telescopic equipment, all right? Telescope Astronomers use special equipment. If you, look, yeah, if you look at the sun through binoculars or a telescope, it's the last thing you will ever look at. Right. So it's a, it's a one dangerous object, but uh, we, we have got special equipment which allows us to observe the sun. Now, when you do look at the sun on Thursday, you see what we call prominences. And, and for those of you watching on TV, you can see these, at the surface of the sun, these great loops. I mean, these are gigantic. Remember, the sun is, the earth would just be a dot. Now, these actually where the magnetic field of the sun is travelling through the atmosphere. At the way it goes into the sun, at either end you'll find a sunspot. And so those loops are showing you where the magnetic field is. And the reason why you can see it is enormous electrical currents are flowing along there. 
right? And so much so that <laughs> not just you, but if you put the earth in the way of those next world currents, they would just vaporize, okay? Uh, so these are enormous, powerful things. But what happens... Billions of amps. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yes. But every now and again, because these things are moving, now and again, two of them clash. And when that happens, we get an enormous explosion on the surface of the sun, all right? And when that happens, that creates what we call a flare. And in the, in the small t views of the sun, you can see it as a bright spot appearing, a titanic explosion as two of these prominents actually short out. And it creates this massive eruption, all right? Then what happens is we get a magnetic storm. As that material from the sun rushes outwards, it hits the Earth's magnetic field and sweeps it away. So that beautiful magnetic field, which is normally protecting the Earth, when we get hit by a solar flare, it vanishes. It gets squashed, doesn't it? No, it completely gets blasted off. Oh, okay. Now, fortunately enough... It's almost like a magnetic short. Yeah, it is. So, and yes. The important thing is that it reforms within about 24 hours, which is pretty lucky, right? Because what's happening, you've lost all that uh, protection mm. from the thing, and all this deadly radiation can then begin to pour into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and you can see this as explosive auroras which occur. But we can always often predict often when these things are going to occur, right? Now, magnetic storms produce nitrous oxide in the upper atmosphere. Nitrous oxide depletes ozone. For every 1% decrease in ozone, there is a 3% increase in the amount of ultraviolet radiation reaching the surface of the Earth, right? So now we can see what's happening here, right? Good for plants. Plants pull on lots of growth. Not so good and for, for animals yes. and humans because that means you get burned. So you've got to bear in mind as we begin to head towards a solar maximum, I'll be showing you that later. Do the other animals on Earth too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Hence, the more UV reaches the surface of the Earth at solar maximum. Right. Now, I've got a little tiny movie here I wanted to show you. And what it, we've got actual films actually taken by NASA. This image here at the centre actually shows you the sun, and you'll see that it moving. The outer image is also showing you the edge of the sun, expanded, so you can see what's happening on the edge of the sun. And this is just showing you over about a year period. Each second lasts for about, um, is equal to about four days or something like that. But you can begin to see solar activity, and you'll notice how it begins to increase. It's like a great big bubble coming out. Each second is 3.7 years. And this is showing you from 2010, just over a year period, to 2011. Here we go. Yeah. Is it going to play? Eh? Yeah, there's no sound coming through at the moment. So, oh, we'll have to touch it. Have, have to go sorry on. Sorry, folks, for some reason that, that particular movie wasn't working. We'll, we'll show you the next time. We oh, do. you've got a movie? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. It's all right. We can, we can play that. Okay, just how many minutes have we got left, sir? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, look at the big picture, all right? Let's have a look. The big picture, we can draw up sol changes in solar activity going back about 7,000 years. And the reason for that, the oldest trees on Earth, living trees, about 7,000 years old. And by taking core samples of these trees, we can look and see what was happening, the big picture. And for those of you watching us on TV, you can see that big picture there, all right? Now, the interesting thing is how this affects life on Earth, all right? So, for example, if you draw them down, you will find that every major change, rise and fall of a civilization is invariably due to some major change in solar activity, okay? So, for example, there were three great um, civilizations in ancient Egypt, all right? And, well... 
they are all occur at either two highs or low in solar activity. You see, whenever we sort of portray ancient Egypt, we tend to portray it as we see it today as a desert. It's a big desert, yes. But it wasn't like that. If you look, look at the pictures painted by people at that time, there were green fields and forests. You see, what happened was you had a civilization which was dependent, like all civilization on Tucker. Then the climate changed. Yes. The rain stopped coming and the civilization There's collapsed. There's evidence of rain erosion in the sinks enclosure. Yeah. In um, uh, Lower Egypt. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and also, um, for example, the Viking invasions, again, it's not because they said, let's go and invade. What happened is the temperature started falling, the conditions got worse and worse in where they were living, and so they began to migrate. But of course, there were other people living there, so that eventually became an invasion. All right? And we find exactly the same with the Mongol invasions also. It's related to a peak in solar activity. Yeah. So that's looking at the big picture, and we've got our own picture at the moment. We're here. We're at the rise point of a of a of a, a peak. peak coming through. All right. So the solar cycle has a lot to do with human history. Yes, think. absolutely. Yes. So we've we've got something coming up. So anyway, just to just to point out, I won't go on any further. We can look at this in more detail later of global warming and the impact. This is not taking away what human beings are doing. What human beings are doing is on top of all of that, all right? Yeah. Exacerbating it. Exactly. So that's why I have to do it. Anyway, folks, with that, we'd better shut down because I think we've run out of time. But just to point out to you at the Phoenix Astronomical Society, which is coming up on Saturday, uh, April 22nd, Kay. Is Hello, everyone. A special talk on the mysterious world of Enceladus. All right. Mm. So that's co coming up there. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> so come along. So we've got some people there. And we also, yeah. and we're doing Star Trek's. And we've got the winter solstice coming up all right, uh, in June. But we'll talk about all those things later. Sunset presentation, live music and stargazing. Yeah, live music with that guy over there. He's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, folks, we'd better shut up now because I think we've run out of time. Okay. We'll catch you people later. Right. Yeah, see you around. Yeah.